Hello, everyone, and welcome to this online event. Uh, I'm Larissa Grolamond, Assistant Curator of Medieval and Renaissance Manuscripts here at the Getty Museum. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the kickoff event for our virtual symposium, Mythical Pasts, Fantasy Futures, the Middle Ages and Modern Visual Culture, co-hosted by the Getty and the Haggerty Museum of Art. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, captions are enabled, um, so you can choose to turn those on or off. Um, and the chat is open, but please submit any questions that you'd like to pose to the panelists through the Q&A box, and we'll make sure that we get to those toward the end of the event today. Um, before we get to the main event, um, I just want to acknowledge the hard work of many, many people who made this event possible. Uh, my co-organizer, Sarah Schaefer, who you'll hear from uh, momentarily, and the Getty team that includes Greg Sandoval, Daniela Alvarez, and Dan Daniela Espino, and our behind-the-scenes AV team, including Heather Alviar and Clark Betty. A huge thanks also to Amelia Layden at the Haggerty Museum of Art, who wears many hats, all of them with immense style. Uh, today's panel and the wide away array of talks in tomorrow's program address the theme of medievalism in modern fantasy visual culture. Uh, and where better to have this discussion than online, truly the next frontier of modern and medieval uh, fantasy. I'm so excited to have been able to co-organize the symposium with Sarah and the Haggerty across time zones and geographies, thanks to the magic of Zoom and the internet. Um, this online symposium brings together an interdisciplinary group of academics and museum professionals from across the country and the world to examine how the Middle Ages appear in, in the contemporary imagination and how its, its aesthetics have inspired a wide variety of media. But it also accompanies two IRL exhibitions, The Fantasy of the Middle Ages here at the Getty and J.R.R. Tolkien, The Art of the Manuscript at the Haggerty. The Fantasy of the Middle Ages um, on view for just a few more days at the Getty. Um, you have until Sunday to see it. Um, and the publication of the same name uh, takes a broad look at the construction of the Middle Ages and popular media since the period itself. Each new iteration layering in more details and representing the period for new audiences with each passing decade and century. The show traces storytelling from the medieval period into the fairy tales and Arthuriana of the 19th century through reenactments and cinema of the 20th and 21st centuries, allowing visitors to reflect on how popular ideas of the Middle Ages have been formed over many hundreds of years and continue to influence our idea of a period of castles, cathedrals, and chronic diseases even today. We'll hear much more about this uh, from our panelists today, but let me first throw it to Sarah for a brief introduction to J.R.R. Tolkien and the art of the manuscript. Sarah? Thanks, Larissa. Um, and I will echo Larissa's many thank yous to all the people who have helped make this um, really exciting symposium come together. So I'll just say a few words about uh, the exhibition that I co-curated, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, The Art of the Manuscript, which brings together um, a selection from the Tolkien Archive at Marquette University, which holds the drafts for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, as well as Tolkien's short stories, Farmer Giles of Ham and Mr. Bliss, along with about three dozen objects on loan from the Bodleian Library's Tolkien Archive, and a range of supplementary books and artworks, most significantly in the form of facsimiles of medieval manuscripts. With this exhibition and the accompanying catalog, my co-curator, uh, William Fliss, who's the Tolkien archivist at Marquette, and I sought to give visitors uh, insight into Tolkien's working process uh, and major sources of influence through the overarching lens of the manuscript. That is the manuscript both as a handwritten work often associated with the Middle Ages, so the kinds of objects that Larissa and Brian Keane, her co-curator, who you'll meet a little bit later, um, study and that Tolkien himself was deeply familiar with. And also the manuscript as a draft of a not yet published work. And I'll give a little more detail on the exhibition during tomorrow's introductory remarks and Larissa will be doing the same for the fantasy of the Middle Ages. Uh, but for now, I just wanna highlight some of the ways in which um, um, an expanded approach to the visual and material wends its way into this exhibition. Um, as many of you know, the starting point for much of Tolkien's secondary world was his invented languages, and many can now claim proficiency in, say, Sindar and Elvish, and I believe Brian is one of those. Uh, we give much attention in the exhibition to Tolkien's calligraphy, exploring, for instance, the runic kirth in relation to uh, medieval tombs or the Feanorian Tengwar's similarities to insular and Carolingian scripts. 
in his many uh, in many of his watercolor illustrations, a focus uh, primarily in the final section of the exhibition, a medieval aesthetic becomes more thoroughly medievalizing, reflecting the profusion of popular illustrated books of fantasy, fairy tales, and folklore that Tolkien knew from a young age. Uh, the complex borrowings, adaptations, and inventions that pervade Tolkien's output, output have been the subject of much debate and scholarship, and our hope, um, our hope, are one of the uh, objectives we hope to achieve with the art of the manuscript uh, was to ground these conversations in the visual and material as well as the literary and textual. And I believe I can speak for both myself and Larissa and most likely everyone who will be participating in this symposium over the next day uh, in saying that I'm greatly looking forward to what, uh, what will no doubt be a highly productive set of interventions in the realm of medievalizing fantasy culture. So we'll turn it back over to Larissa now. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, and now let's get to the main event, shall we? Um, our moderator today is Brian C. Keen, um, who is the co-creator on the Fantasy Project uh, and assistant professor of art history at Riverside City College and a former associate curator of manuscripts at the Getty Museum. And I have it on good authority, a major nerd. Uh, so he's the perfect person to moderate today's conversation. So Brian, uh, with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Larissa and Sarah, for inviting me today. I'm truly honored to be here, and I will proudly wear that badge of uh, mega nerd today. I'm just balancing three different screens to make sure that I get you the accurate image. And hopefully with a thumbs up from Larissa, I'll be able to say a little bit more. As I say, I'm honored to be here at the start of this remarkable symposium. And before introducing two incredible scholars, uh, I wanted to offer a few brief remarks about what we mean by medieval, medievalism, and fantasy, since these terms will be at the heart of our discussion for today and tomorrow. And to do so, I felt that it was important to ground us. We can begin by looking at this painting and digital collage by Katie Dorame who is a Tongva native artist. The Tongva are one of the many first peoples of the land and waters around Los Angeles, where I live and work. And I offer, therefore, this afternoon, my gratitude and respect to their ancestors and community members of the past, present, and those emerging, as well as all of those indigenous peoples who have called this place home and continue to live here today. In her work, Dora May layers historic and current views of the urban scapes of this region with works of European art, including paintings that come from the year 1300, that is, toward the end of the period 500 to 1500, that is typically described as the European Middle Ages. She demonstrates a way of seeing through time with past, present, and future commingling as overlapping strata. She encourages viewers to see the memories and the mythologies that are embedded in the world all around us, including the names of places, monuments, architectural styles, and objects in museums. We might briefly think about style in architecture, such as that famous period of the cathedrals in Europe that Larissa just mentioned. The Gothic style in French and European architecture can be found all around the world, the product of colonialism, imperialism, revival aesthetics, and more, a few of which can be seen in greater detail here. The medieval environment, the built space, surrounds people all around the planet. By starting with this land acknowledgement and a discussion about what we mean by medieval, we can reflect upon the question that Larissa and I often ask ourselves as curators and asked in our book. Whose stories do we tell when we speak of the land around us? And similarly, whose stories do we tell when we speak of the Middle Ages? Although the concept of a medieval period developed in Europe over many centuries and is tied to ideas about nationalism, race, modernity, and much more, in the last two decades, we've seen an increasing move by scholars, museums, and others to speak about a global Middle Ages. Now, that's not to say that all places and all times experienced a Middle Age in their history. On the contrary, it's to suggest that this methodology or approach allows us to decenter Europe from the narrative about the past and to disrupt and dismantle much of the 19th and 20th century ideologies behind the field of European medieval studies. <laughs> 
The 19th century, as we'll hear more about today and tomorrow, serves as a fulcrum for conversations about the development of the fantasy genre, which often includes the commingling of historical archetypes, settings, and more with elements of magic and folklore. Creators of fantasy often speak of the inspirations from literary and visual culture in their world building. We'll also see the way in which these many medievalisms owe much to the 19th century. In the fantasy of the Middle Ages, Larissa and I were conscious of the need to balance a presentation about the Middle Ages that acknowledged the long and often continued marginalization of certain groups from the presentation of the past, and to interrogate the role that medievalisms, all of those creative reinterpretations of the medieval past itself, continue to play in perpetuating those views of the Middle Ages. So it's refreshing when fantasy shows and stories include powerful female characters alongside a cast of actors of color and queer and trans individuals, all of whom have agency of their own. Each of these individuals already existed in the medieval past, in the past of the pre-modern world, if at times under different guises and described using different terms than those used today. I have to acknowledge that we owe much in large part to scholars of color who have worked to correct the view of the Middle Ages that otherwise is presented as one dominated by white, wealthy, Christian, heterosexual, cisgender men. It wasn't, it never was. The story of King Arthur offers one example of the necessary corrective. Stories of the King of the Britons developed gradually over centuries with new characters, peoples, plot points, and locations added to reflect the ideals and concerns of the day. Very much the same way that Arthurian films tell us more about our own expectations of the Middle Ages than about the medieval world itself. And by our, I'm often referring to our of the American filmmakers or of the European circuit or of the anime and manga cycles as well. As a scholar, when I read outcries from fandoms about casting and plot decisions, such as the recent vitriol surrounding Dev Patel's role as Sir Gawain or Sir Gawain or Sir Garwin in The Green Knight, or about the kiss that he received from Lord Bertilak, I feel conflicted because knights of color and queer couplings existed in the medieval fantasy texts of Arthuriana itself. And as true as that is, it shouldn't matter because we're talking about fantasy stories. They involve magic. Why can't we open our minds to allow casts of color and queer relationships? This was, of course, made abundantly clear in Amazon Prime's The Rings of Power tweet yesterday, supported by the cast of the Lord of the Rings films and by the Star Wars franchise itself, standing in solidarity with the actors of color who have experienced intense racism from a segment of the fandom. We see this continually playing out in realms like Dungeons and Dragons or Renaissance fairs, medieval times and other live action role playing games or convenings, reminding us of the continued urgency to address racism or sexism, homophobia and transphobia, etc. head on. Since today is Star Trek Day, which commemorates the first episode in 1966, I'm reminded of the various medievalisms in the series that I grew up watching in a home of sci-fi loving parents. Thanks, mom and dad. And I thank my student, Hannah Schwarzel Rauch, for reminding me of this milestone day and the titles of each of the episodes below. The quote at center from Leonard Nimoy is a sentiment I often return to when thinking about fantasy, medievalisms, fandoms, and adaptations. He writes that canon, which is anything that is considered central or core to a lore or legendarium, is only important to certain people because they have to cling to their knowledge of minutia. Open your mind and be a Star Trek fan who asks, where does Star Trek want to take me now? So where do the Middle Ages want to take us now? Where do medievalisms and fantasy want to take us now? To that end, I wanted to highlight the positive roles that fandoms can play in education, even of curators, or probably especially of curators. My academic training is as an Italianist and a manuscript specialist, so the fencing manual at left is one I've long studied as a scholar. However, I've learned more about the text, the illustrations, as well as the author, the court, and the martial arts in general from a friend and Getty donor, Brian Stokes, who practices as part of historical European martial arts, or HEMA. 
His knowledge of this object and of this moment in the Middle Ages, as well as the many Middle e medievalisms inspired by the manuscript in print, in film, and in reenactment, is far deeper and more passionate than mine will ever be. It was thus so exciting to be able to venture to Milan with him to track down another version of the text in a private collection. We spent a wonderful afternoon in a bank vault, enjoying and reenacting the manuscript I learned from him in that moment. After all, the very study of the Middle Ages as an academic discipline is a medievalism, this creative re reinterpretation of the past, something that is on prominent display by the two annual international gatherings of medievalists at Kalamazoo or Leeds. I'll also say that I'm here for medieval TikTok or the greedy peasant or any other form of medieval social media initiatives because we are seeing a wide segment of a global community embracing the Middle Ages, where bathrobes become wizard's robes and where a scarf and a gown can become peasant or queen attire, depending on the color and uh, decoration. And so I'm excited to dive deeper into the themes of how the Middle Ages appear in contemporary imagination and how the aesthetics have inspired a wide variety of media, including some examples here drawn from collectibles at the Getty uh, staff members on view in the exhibition. With that, it is my esteemed pleasure to introduce our two panelists this evening. Andrea Rager is a specialist in 19th century British and European art, with a particular focus on the work of painter and decorative artist Edward Byrne Jones. Her research interests include pre-Raphaelitism and aestheticism in the 19th century in Britain, movements that I hope all of you are quite familiar with or will spend time delving into more, as well as a history of photography from the 19th century to the present, imperialism, and the relationship between art, the environment, and eco-criticism. She's published widely, and a few of her works and talks are on screen, writings about Briar Rose and Edward Byrne Jones, nostalgic longing for the painter of light in reference to Thomas Kincaid's art, as well as the pre-Raphaelite lens, British photography and painting 1848 to 1875 in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, that will appear in the forthcoming issue of Victorian Literature and Culture. We're also joined by Roland Betancourt. He was a professor of art history at California, University of California, Irvine. And in 2016 to 17, he was the Elizabeth and J. Richardson Dilworth Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Professor Betancourt's work has looked at the role of Byzantine art in modern and contemporary art and popular culture, as in the edited volume, Byzantium and Modernism, the Byzantine as Method in Modernity, by which we mean the Eastern Roman Empire or the Roman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. He also proposes new theories of vision and light in ancient Greek and Byzantine worlds by distancing sight from touch. His book, Byzantine Intersectionality on the Intersection of Race, Sexuality, and Gender Identity in the Medieval World, is a remarkably teachable book, a deep read, and another book on the recitation and performance of the gospel in the divine liturgy. His research also covers contemporary concerns, including an interest in new media, online culture, fandom, YouTube, YouTubers, as well as an ongoing project about simulacral spaces and theme parks, such as Las Vegas and Disneyland. Can I at this time then welcome Andrea Rager to the to the podium? Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Brian. I'm just going to share my screen. And I want to thank the um, symposium organizers, especially the J. Paul Getty Museum and the Hegarty Art Museum. And uh, also thank you to uh, Larissa, Sarah, Brian, and all the behind the scenes people who helped make this possible today. Edward Byrne Jones's monumental painting, King Cophetua and the Beggar Maid, completed in 1884, depicts an armored king who has removed his crown and unsheathed his sword in homage before a pale female figure in a thin gray gown. Soaring 12 feet in height and surrounded by an ornate gilded frame, the painting possesses an alluring and absorptive tactility on an overwhelming scale. Featuring sumptuous details of jewels, textiles, metalwork, and flowers, all rendered in richly saturated tones with a lush, shimmering surface. 
Inspired by a traditional English ballad later retold by Alfred Tennyson and his poem, The Beggar Maid of 1842, Cofetua was an African king who fell in love with an impoverished maiden and made her his queen. The visual narrative offered to the viewer by Burne Jones, adapted from this poem and its earlier Renaissance and medieval iterations, is that of a world turned upside down, disrupting the established hierarchical order of the 19th century, where poverty rises above wealth, physical weakness above strength, woman above man. This radical vision of social, economic, and political upheaval is dressed in the aesthetic language of medievalism what we might now term the aesthetics of fantasy. His embrace of the fantastical, of dreams and even magic, has fueled the perception that Burne Jones was nothing more than an escapist who withdrew from the harsh realities of the Victorian era into imaginary realms of his own creation, eschewing modernity to depict a languid world of fairy tales and mythic heroes adorned in the garments of the past with little relevance to the contemporary world, then or now, a charge often laid against the artists of the Pre-Raphaelite circle in the 19th century and still used by some to dismiss the fantasy genre and its creators today. However, summarily dismissing Burne Jones and the fantastical more broadly fails to acknowledge the revolutionary capacity for such immersive aesthetic encounters to disrupt and challenge the perceptions of an audience. As a painting that blatantly unsettled the entrenched order of the age, that employed an ancient legend to call attention to the modern obsession with materiality and that proclaimed the nature of its making, King Cofetua and the Beggar Maid depicted a multi-layered vision of what might be, of a world rooted in fellowship rather than acquisition in which beauty can be set free for all. The painting, I argue, functioned as a secular altarpiece that flouted the modern art market and exhibition system, inviting the viewer to cross the threshold of the painting and experience a transformative encounter with the decorative. It was a potent site-specific disruption of the public and private spaces in which it appeared and a visual manifesto of craft practice as a rebellious act. In my opening comments this evening, I will explore how Burne Jones did not just adopt the accoutrement of a fantastical past, but also revived the medieval concept of dreams as visionary states. With monumental paintings such as King Cofetu and the Beggar Maid, he hoped to reveal the utopian power of embodied aesthetic experiences, not as a retreat, but as a vehicle for revolutionary awakening. In his 1998 text, The Cultural Turn, Philosopher and literary theorist Frederick Jameson suggested that, as deceptively familiar as Victorian society seems, the potent critique offered by the aesthetic protest against commodity culture and industrial mass consumerism offered by artists like William Morris, and I would add Burne Jones, no longer appears as radical as it once did. Jameson writes, the final point I want to make has to do with beauty itself. It only seems appropriate in the present context to recall beauty's subversive role in a society marred by nascent commodification. The fin de siècle from Morris to Wilde deployed beauty as a political weapon against a complacent materialist Victorian bourgeois society and dramatized its negative power as what rebukes commerce and money and what generates a longing for personal and social transformation in the heart of an ugly industrial society. Jameson claims that since the image became so ubiquitous and commodified in the postmodern era, it was no longer possible to perceive beauty as a critique. In his later text, Archaeologies of the Future, published in 2005, Jameson went on to argue for utopian form as capable of generating revolutionary pockets of stasis from which disrupt dominant power structures and elicit the desire for revolutionary change. Jameson describes utopian form as, quote, a representational meditation on radical difference, radical otherness, end quote. Discussing Morris's socialist dream vision novel, News from Nowhere, as a key example, he argues for the utopian form as positing a radical break with the present in order to depict a future that seems impossible. In keeping with Jameson's theory of utopian disruption forming a pocket of stasis from which to reflect back on and critique the world, where an alternate future can be imagined and then enacted. I argue that across his diverse artistic practice encompassing painting and a wide range of decorative arts projects, Burton Jones left behind a series of aesthetic havens to inspire the people of his own day 
and generations to come, including paintings like King Capetua and the Beggar Maid. As a young student at Oxford in the early 1850s, alongside William Morris, Burne Jones first began to rebel against what he perceived as the injustices of modernity, defined by utilitarianism, industrialization, imperialism, capitalist acquisitive materialism, and a pervasive disregard for the sanctity of the natural world and the suffering of collective humanity. Burne Jones vowed to embark on what he termed his crusade and holy warfare against the age, the heartless coldness of the times. After declaring that he would abandon Christian ministry for the secular ministry of art, his protest against the age took the form of immersive, epiphanic aesthetic experiences, Jameson's pockets of radical utopia. Burne Jones remained true to his quest to confront the age through the vital address of the visual arts throughout his life. Again and again, across a wide range of media, he advocated for the need to awaken from the industrial devastation of the 19th century through the revival of artistic handicraft and pleasurable labor, the return to an intimate appreciation of nature, and the realization of social equality through fellowship, each intrinsically bound to the other. He saw around him a world almost impossibly broken and strove to instill in others the desire to put the fractured pieces back together. Dissatisfied with the London art market, which privileged the portable, easily commodified oil on canvas medium, Burne Jones continually sought to exceed the established parameters of painting, either through expansive multi-work cycles, such as the Briar Rose series seen here, or through colossal individual works, such as King Capetua, which generated site-specific immersive environments through their scale and absorptive qualities. With this single expansive canvas created at the height of his career and amid his rising public status as an artist, Burne Jones interrogated not only the possibilities of the painted surface, but also the capacity for art to challenge the perceptions of an audience. Emulating the form, proportions, and spiritual imperative of a Renaissance altarpiece, King Cofetua rebelled against the institutions that kept art, wealth, and visual beauty in captivity. Indeed, it is imperative to consider King Cofetua and the Beggar Maid not just as a flat image, as it so often appears in digital and printed reproduction, but as a complete crafted object, what scholar Elizabeth Pretchon has termed, quote, a presence in the world. Burne Jones, the son of a gilder and carver, often designed custom frames for his paintings, and this is particularly notable in King Cofetua. Commissioned from the workshop of Andrew and Paul Bacani, this immense gilded Italianate revival frame was unsympathetically altered at an unknown point early in the 20th century to accommodate a glazing window. In 2011, when Tate Britain undertook the repair and restoration of the frame, the conservator, Alistair Johnson, discovered this photograph by Emery Walker of the painting with the frame in its original state, as it appeared at the memorial exhibition for Burne Jones at the New Gallery in 1898. In Walker's photograph, it is evident that the frame was created not merely as an accent, but as an integral part of the painting. Notably, the upper and lower corners of the pilasters on either side of the frame intersect with the edges of the painted throne within the picture to create a sense of receding space. Amplifying the illusion, the frame in turn seemingly extends the interior scene depicted in the painting, allowing it to project forward into the room where the viewer stands. Such an incorporation of the frame into its surroundings is most commonly found in Renaissance altarpieces, such as Giovanni Bellini's 1488 Ferrari triptych. With King Cofetto, Burne Jones harnessed this quality of the architectural altarpiece frame, transforming his monumental painting into a permeable threshold where the secular and spiritual worlds converge. The strong verticality and vertiginous height of the painting enhance this effect still more, approximating the scale and impact of an altarpiece. By adopting this traditional format, Burne Jones not only imbued the folktale with an aura of spiritual consequence, but also forged a consecrated space that dictated its own terms of engagement. Whether placed on the wall of a gallery or a wealthy home, the painting therefore disrupts the site by creating a gateway that opens onto immersive utopian vision of the world that might be. The original structure and appearance of the frame is thus vital to the impact of the painting as a complete decorative object, an effect that was obscured throughout most of the 20th century and has only recently been recovered. As a testament to the potential disruptive power of the aesthetics of fantasy as harnessed by Burne Jones, 
I would like to conclude with an exploration of how the painting was received when it was exhibited in the English section of the Palais des Beaux-Arts at the Paris Universal Exposition of 1889. Commemorating the centennial of the French Revolution, the exposition featured dizzying modern spectacles and feats of industrial manufacture. These included Gustave Eiffel's soaring ironwork tower, fantastical electric light displays, the behemoth gallery of machines, and theatrical colonial tableau. The Universal Exposition thereby exemplified all that Burne Jones invade against in the modern era insatiable capitalist materialism, mechanistic industrial architecture, and callous imperialist aggression and oppression. In contrast to the riotous atmosphere found throughout most of the exposition, visitors who wandered into the Fine Arts Pavilion to stand before Burne Jones's King Cophetua encountered a mesmerizing vision of quiet contemplation that poignantly rebuked the cacophonous crowds beyond. Set against the backdrop of this concentrated and frenzied microcosm of urban modernity, industrial consumerism, and imperialist propaganda, King Cofetua achieved a striking air of immediacy, proving confrontational and epithanic. Following Burne Jones's death in 1898, both French art critic Robert de la Cisarin and Belgian artist Fernand Knopf chose to center their commemorative essays on their still vivid memories of the contrast between the frenetic atmosphere of the Universal Exposition and the quietly provocative vision of King Cofetua and the Beggar Maid. As an artist, Knopf highlighted the visceral, emotional, unexpectedly ennobling experience of encountering, quote, this work of intense beauty, which upended his perception of the divide between dreams and reality. According to Knopf, quote, this artist's dream, deliciously bewildering, had become the real. And at this moment, it was the elbowing and struggling reality that seemed a dream, or rather a nightmare, end quote. Cesarin was simultaneously bolder and more concrete in his declaration of the political significance of the painting for any who encountered it, stating, quote, we visitors had come forth from the universal exhibition of wealth to see the symbolical expression of the scorn of wealth. It was a dream, but a noble dream. It was the revenge of art on life." End quote. He elaborated on the acute disparity between the experience of the exposition and the realm presented to the viewer within Burne Jones's painting, as well as the implicit condemnation of modernity, writing, all around this room were others, where emblems and signs of strength and luxury were collected from all the nations of the world. And here behold a king laying his crown at the feet of a beggar maid for her beauty's sake. Cesaran found not only an attack on material greed in King Cophetua, but also recognized the critique of imperialism contained within this painting of a chivalric knight setting aside his arms before his beloved. Quote, there might be seen the most highly wrought instruments of war, cannons, models of armor-plated ships, and torpedoes, he commented on most of the exhibition. But, quote, here was a knight duly clad in iron, bowing in his strength before weakness for innocence, innocence sake. Finally, in a declaration that should silence any doubts as to the inherent socialist connotations of this image, Cesarin concluded that King Cofetua and the beggar maid depicted, quote, the apotheosis of poverty, quite simply, the beggar ascendant over the king. Following his revelatory encounter with King Cofetua and the Beggar Maid at the Paris Exposition, Cesarin wrote to Burne Jones to learn more about his work and approach to art. The French critics stressed the contemporary relevance he perceived in Burne Jones's painting as a protest against the materialism and alienation of modernity. Acknowledging that this aspect of his work was not always understood, Burne Jones replied, quote, it is a matter of just complaint that I seem to my contemporaries to stand outside of their aspirations and desires so perpetually, seem to more than I really do. It was not a fault, it was a force. A substantial lineage of artists and artistic projects inspired by Burne Jones and his work could be traced from the 19th century to the present. And Larissa and Brian's spectacular exhibition is a testimony to the enduring creative potential of the aesthetics of fantasy as disruptive pockets of imaginative utopia, which I look forward to discussing in our panel this evening. Rejecting the ethos of competitive capitalism and the endless chain of winners and losers, the untroubled teleology of linear progress, Burne Jones and his lifelong working partner, William Morris, instead perceived time moving along the spiral, embracing an ebb and flow, a waxing and waning spanning centuries. 
the teenage rebellion of Burne Jones and Morris against the flawed and troubled world of their day was inspired by art from the medieval past, and the two culled its lessons for a distant future they wished to bring into being. Morris's personal motto is the Latin phrase, ars longa, vita brevis. In other words, life may be short, but art endures. Thank you. And I'm going to turn things over now to Roland. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, so what I would like to talk to you about today is the question of medieval um, revivalisms in the, in the matter, in the questions of theming more specifically. Can everyone see me? Yeah. Um, what I'm showing you on the screen is a useful comparison that I often show to my students um, who going to the University of California, Irvine, are very familiar with one of the spaces that I'm talking about. On the left, we have a Nazareth column from the Court of the Lions in the Alhambra. And on the right, we have a plaster copy of one of those capitals at the Irvine Spectrum Center. The Irvine Spectrum Center opened in 1995 and has had subsequent phases of expansion. And today in particular, I'll be speaking about its second phase of construction, with, which opened in 1998. The, just to give you some sense in relationship to the Getty, um, the Irvine Spectrum Center is roughly about 60 miles south of the Getty Center um, if you drive just down the 405. And quite importantly, it is at the intersection of the 5 and 405, essentially where the 405 peels off of the 5 freeway in that triangle between the two highways. And anecdotal evidence about the construction of the center um, was sort of this very dramatic moment where the construction company, the Irvine company, um, went on site and sort of said, we will build the Alhambra here at the intersection of the 5 and the 405, which sort of speaks to the oddities and uniqueness of this site. And what you're seeing here is an overview of the site after its first and second phases, so the 1995 and 1998 phases. And the phase that I'm most interested in is the one that does not have those white walls. Um, the first phase was a pretty conventional mall, um, but the second phase really sought to create a sort of meticulous reconstruction of the Alhambra in Southern California. And this is the period of sort of high theming. Um, a place like Las Vegas is probably um, one of the sites that is most known for this, the so-called Disneyfication of Las Vegas, which with themed hotels like the Excalibur, Luxor, and sort of culminating with the Venetian over the course of the 1990s. And much of what we see in the Venetian is really sort of the taking of St. Mark's Piazza um, in Venice and sort of opening it up so that it can fit nicely onto the strip with a very meticulous attention to theming. One of the things that I really confront in a lot of my work in thinking through theme spaces um, very broadly is this question of specificity. And just to illustrate what I mean by that, I will turn here to the plaster cast of the justice columns of the capital, specifically of the justice columns in the Doge's Palace in Venice, which were copied for the creation of the Venetian down to their Latin inscriptions. Oftentimes these spaces in this period, particularly of the late 90s, are marked by a meticulous attention to detail that we often would think is sort of counterintuitive to what theming is doing in places like Disneyland, where you expect that people are seeking out a vague impression of a period or um, of an experience, but not often sort of looking at the details to create this illusion. But what is very interesting here is the amount of detail and specificity that these spaces um, actually can evidence. And so when I approached the Irvine Spectrum Center, um, one of my colleagues had actually said, you should go, it's basically the Alhambra. And I expected a very sort of vague approach to theming. Um, as we can see in other malls of the period, um, the desert passages in Las Vegas, for example, is a good, is a good example, um, even though I don't have an image of it here. Um, but essentially, what I sort of asked myself is how much detail can I parse out in the space of the so-called Irvine Spectrum's Alhambra? And in doing so, I attempted to look closely at the iconography 
in comparison with the Alhambra and try to trace down how the different spaces were playing out with that iconography. And I'm sort of laying this out for you here in this map to give you a sense of the walkthrough that I'm going to do now. So in a very quick and reduced version, I am going to give you a sort of quick walkthrough of what the experience is of moving um, from this gate of justice by the Cheesecake Factory and out through the Generalife Gardens that sort of culminates the space of the Alhambra theming of the Irvine Spectrum Center, which essentially just follows this broken line going through one portion of the building. And I'm going to sort of try to overlay this as well with the site of the Alhambra itself. And one of the first things that you'll notice here is that the space is not trying to emulate the sort of structure of the palace itself, but rather an experience of moving through that space. One of the first things that you can do here, which is quite striking, is that if you sort of circumvent um, the space of the Alhambra and navigate around it, um, what you begin to see is this impressive attention to detail, this desire to be meticulous in theming down to the um, brick and mortar walls, um, these rough hewn walls that sort of outline this portion of the Alhambra. And you begin this journey in this impressively um, postmodern space where you have this gate of justice abstracted down to its essential elements, the horseshoe arch with the alternating color voussures, and this hand that is prominently displayed um, on top of it. I also particularly love the fact that at night this glows with neon light around it, um, emphasizing that sort of removal. And I just give you here a detail of the hand on the top left of your screen um, that is located at the gate of justice and the hand below it that is located at the spectrum. And some comparisons here with Nazrid um, Quran cases that used a similar iconography and were often associated um, with the Nazrid dynasty, which quite interestingly, the Irvine Spectrum Center sort of understands in the context of old Spanish legend without making any mention of the Nazareth dynasty. As you move past that space, then what you begin to experience is essentially a broken line. And one of the key things that this broken line does is that it basically breaks off your lines of sight so that you're not able to see the other discrete spaces. So these spaces in the middle are sort of these Orientalist imagined bizarre spaces, um, as you can see with these canopies hanging overhead that basically isolate you from the more discrete spaces of the Alhambra that are being reproduced. And the first space that you of course confront is the Court of the Lion Lions, which really sort of captures the sort of idea of the Alhambra. And for most people who might be familiar with the space, this is probably what the theming sort of boils down to. Um, and it's quite fascinating. You have here these sort of garden shop lions that are placed around these circular orbs, um, sort of emulating the lions, not mimetically, but sort of the idea that there are lions around a fountain. And you even have a rendition of a pseudo Arabic inscription that you can see um, similarly around the base of the fountain in the Alhambra itself. So these very intricate attentions to detail that not only involve the creation of plaster casts of certain elements, but also this attention to duplicating some of the inscriptions found on the building itself. As you move through this space, you also begin to notice that there is an attention to proportion and scale, as well as the overarching space. This is sort of another view of the Court of the Lions, which should um, demonstrate the similarities here with similar ornamentations on the capitals and shafts of the columns, and this large arch with the three um, smaller windows above. It is this level of detail which begins to surprise my students and my colleagues whenever I speak of this building. And you can see in many um, ways, the ways in which you have a sort of boiling down of the ornamentation of the site to these sort of flattened out patterns that can be mass produced for the various needs of the site overall, but still attempting to have a sort of um, substitution of each of these parts with a great deal of specificity. After leaving that space, you enter the um, space in, in the mall that is perhaps the oddest, but can be very clearly identified with the court of the Golden Room, um, which as you can see is defined by that smaller window with those scalloped edges and those two other windows flanking it on the side. 
And one of the most interesting aspects of how this space reads is precisely in the oddity of the proportions and scale of the space. Um, you can see here a closer detail that shows the degree in which they sought to emulate the formats of some of these windows, particularly that small center window, and also the ways in which the space sort of is moved around, which leads you then to a sort of paring down of these sort of iconographic details here when you arrive at the long pond in the Generalife Palace, which is essentially outside of the main Alhambra complex. Here, iconography is essentially boiled down to the shape of the streams of jets that come out of the fountain and this long format of the fountain to sort of capture this sense of this particular space. And it all very quickly culminates in this other fountain that is lower in those gardens, um, which is simply cited by the patterning on the floor. You can see this sort of scalloped pattern with this um, star shaped as it is rendered um, at the Irvine Spectrum Center. Essentially, what you've done throughout this process of walking through this strip is that you haven't really produced a sort of palace that you wander around at your own pace, but what you're really doing is producing in a linear fashion, a tour guide's view of the Alhambra, walking you through these major hits of the palace and then walking down further into the added gardens of the site. And it's quite interesting. It's sort of understood that the theming of the Irvine Spectrum Center came because Donald Bren, who is the head of the Irvine Company, had just come from a trip to Spain and therefore sought to emulate um, this design um, in this mall, in this era where theming was very important. And so it's very interesting here to understand how a tourist gaze is really what is being captured here. It is this linear path of walking through the space as you are guided, rather than this idea to create a palace that has many chambers and rooms that you can get lost in. But one of the things that most fascinated me about the Alhambra um, replication in the Irvine Spectrum Center is that small detail that you see there on the bottom left of this image, um, which is the minaret that sort of is the first thing you see if you're coming to the Spectrum Center from the 405. And this um, minaret is basically located right there in the center. My arrow is pointing to it. And what I find most fascinating is that it doesn't come from the Alhambra. In fact, it is a quite meticulous replica of the minaret of the Qutubia Mosque in Marrakesh, Morocco, um, dating to the 12th century, and which was restored in the early 90s, um, which I believe is not an insignificant detail to keep in mind. But most interestingly, this minaret had perhaps most famously been reproduced in themed architecture um, in 1984 at the Morocco Pavilion in Epcot Center in Disney World, Florida, um, where the Morocco Pavilion was actually commissioned um, or rather sponsored by the state of Morocco. And what you see here is a sort of, um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of the space um, with this wall which um, gives you an idea of how that minaret works within that theme space in Epcot Center. Most of the language around the Spectrum Centers tends to place this minaret in the context of Spain. And so oftentimes it is um, compared to the Giralda um, in Seville Cathedral in Seville, Spain, um, which dates to the 12th century, but with several additions through to the 16th century. But a closer look at it, um, particularly the two windows and the four arches above it, culminating with two um, arches above as well, demonstrate that this is quite a meticulous copy of the Ketubia Mosque's minaret, which demonstrates this interesting moment where we're seeing this medievalism, not only citing actual spaces with a great degree of specificity, but then also turning to other sites that were recognizable within broader theme spaces like Disney World. And even though how the space reads um, from below demonstrates here um, this sort of sensibility where it is the one moment where we move away to, from the Alhambra to cite this other very recognizable monument, which perhaps um, is best captured by its reiteration at Tokyo Disney Sea in the section themed after the Arabian coast um, from 2001, um, which as you can notice, the Irvine Spectrum Center's minaret is actually more closely affiliated with the actual minaret in the details than the one at Tokyo Disney Sea. For me, what's fascinating here is not only how these spaces are composed through their iconography, but also the ways in which these theme spaces then create their own intervisuality, how 
guests who visit these various spaces begin to make comparisons, not to perhaps sites that they are familiar with, but rather with other themed environments that they know, like Walt Disney World or perhaps um, Tokyo Disney Sea. And I'm in particularly always very struck by this in thinking about how much for um, Southern California residents, the marketplace at Galaxy's Edge, which is sort of this Orientalist fantasy that Imagineers talk about going to Marrakesh um, and to Istanbul to take um, sort of inspiration from, how that in many ways reads more like the Irvine Spectrum Center and something far more familiar um, than a galaxy far, far away. It also alerts us to the ways in which theming engages in various forms of cultural appropriation and also the ways in which there seems to have been this very sort of pronounced split between an expectation of viewers with a high degree of legibility no, being able to parse out these experiences and spaces to this idea that perhaps these you know tourist mosque lamps won't read as such in a space like Galaxy's Edge. And so that is something that for me opens up a host of questions about how to think about theming in a world that now has its own histories of theming um, through the past decades and which continues to sort of struggle with degrees of specificity and legibility in these um, various spaces. As I always ask, why these meticulous details? Why these plaster casts? And what is the activity that they are doing? And so I think a lot of this um, opens up a lot of interesting questions for us to talk about um, as a group in the Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roland and Andrea. There are so many interesting synergies. I mean, my mind is sort of bursting. I've written three pages of notes here. And something that immediately jumped out in terms of Andrea's work, I've been thinking a lot about the Universal Exhibitions and the World's Fairs in the 19th century, because they often are themed spaces that put the world on, on view. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1900, there is also a recreation of the Alhambra. We have um, you know, the tower there, just as Roland has discussed, but there are also guidebooks that are then sold, sometimes with illustrations, sometimes not. Um, we have Crystal Palace in London, similarly, and I'm constantly interested in how the Middle Ages is presented, um, how Byzantium, Roland's area, is presented, often really focused on national centers. Sicily becomes a really important Byzantine center across these spaces. So you both bring up these really important points about what's at stake in terms of the representation, and and I love that both of your talks used the terms meticulous um, detail, uh, also a focus on mass production of materials. And I also appreciate the critique both that Byrne Jones had of the, uh, the, the universal exhibitions and these fairs themselves and the capitalist imperialist underpinnings. And the same way, Roland, that you're able to critique the ways in which there's both the attention to detail and the mass production and what this form of Spanish architecture means in California. So there are so many ways that we can begin the conversation. I'd love to hear perhaps a little more your thoughts uh, as scholars and as um, just individuals living in the world today. What, what are the responsibilities of creators in creating themed spaces in relation to publics and public perception? And then what are the responsibilities that we as art historians have in terms of uh, educating publics or being in dialogue with publics? I know that both of you in your educational work think a lot about this in terms of students. So what are, what is at stake and what are the responsibilities that we share as educators, as art historians and, and uh, members of society? Thank you, Brian. That's a big question. Um, and uh, Roland, throughout your talk, yeah, I just kept thinking about the Victorians, right? Because they did almost the same thing, right? Yeah, when the Crystal Palace was moved to Sydenham, there were these kind of detailed um, uh, reenactment of specific sites, you know, down to those little kind of like taking plaster casts and recreating um, the architecture and that kind of drive and desire uh, for the simulacra, right? And for taking those bits and pieces and making them their own and often commercializing them as well. Well, um, and that really also, you know, is traced back to those um, expositions, the very thing that, you know, also inspired Burn Jones and Morris to protest against it, right? Um, so, I mean, I think as, as far as the responsibility goes, um, there is that kind of duality, right, to think of when this type of referencing is uh, appropriation, when it is um, posing as a kind of commodified substitute for the real, um, and then also when it becomes that kind of 
space or site for resistance, um, for uh, you know, creating utopias for resisting and speaking back. And so, um, you know, I think it's always important to to consider the legacy, the history, um, and the way that we interact with these sites now, and that it's telling us a lot more about us, right, than it is in some ways about the past and about how we want to relate to and draw from that past um, moving forward. Yeah, there, there are a lot of great um, points there. Um, I mean, I, one of the things that I cut out of this talk for the sake of time is also thinking about how much the what the Irvine Spectrum Center was doing was actually made possible by the extensive documentation of people like Owen Jones and those books that were easily accessible so that you could um, produce um, a an inscription on your fountain with garden lions um, because of that documentation. I think that's one of the interesting things. I've tried to see if there were any sort of archives for that material, um, but the architecture firms are like, it was the 90s, like that's all gone. Um, but I always, I think that's also something that's really important. And I mean, one of the things that I, it's funny with, you know, with students, friends, everyone that I take to the Irvine Spectrum Center, um, originally there's always that question of like, wait, how is this actually citing this? Like, are you sure this is just theming? And of course I pull out my iPad and I have all the comp comparanda images. And I actually, it was really interesting because I found an old map um, which was somewhere hidden on the site that actually um, demonstrated that early on they were actually citing these various spaces. So the idea that you could take a sort of virtual tour of the Alhambra in each of these locations, which really sort of emphasizes this idea of, of course, like virtual tourism and pilgrimage. Um, and it also speaks a lot to the malleability of spaces. Um, some of the people that I've talked to um, from the sort of consumer side, say that the Irvine Spectrum Center is impossible to work with because it's really hard to get people to flow through it and know how to have their wayfinding. It's impossible to make signs for it um, because it has such a like strange, um, broken line of progression through it. And I think that really speaks to these questions of like the ethics of theming in some ways, um, which is on some levels for me begins in this question of legibility and illegibility. Like when are you expecting someone to be familiar with the theming and be able to parse it out and why? Oftentimes at a place like the Venetian Las Vegas, it comes down to sort of wealth and power of tourism. Um, these notions of a grand tour that endured into the 20th century and of course very much spurred on by the jet age as well. Um, but then there's also this question of when do you expect audiences not to know? And that's one of the things that I found most jarring, you know, the first time I walked through Star Wars Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland, where I was like, why are there moss lamps in Batu? Like, why are there all these tagines stacked up? And it was that question of like legibility that made me also aware of what designers also think that viewers would never be able to read as such. And so for me, that's one of the ways that I also get my students to think a little bit about sort of the ethics of the art historical canon. What do you expect to be legible to you when you become the sort of elite um, in this space? And so thinking through these aspects, I think opens up the question. One of the things that I find very subversive and that I enjoy at the Irvine Spectrum Center a lot is that a lot of people play Pokemon Go in it. And I find that to be a really interesting sort of space and like questioning like these medieval practices of not only palaces, but a space that was meant to be read and look through various um, vistas. And to think also about this idea that there's a sort of other world, the sort of a, a augmented reality world, but also the sort of other spiritual world that is co-inhabiting. And for me, that's one of the things that most powerfully speaks to these other forms of medievalism, which cannot be reduced to sort of iconographic specificity, um, but come to the practices and the fandoms and the cosplaying that happens in these spaces. Yeah, I think something really to that point in terms of these fandoms, so we have the fandoms, we also have the knowledge base, and you've touched on this idea of the expectations for audiences to know or to not know. I think that's something as art historians, we're attuned to looking at the visual. I see there's the comment about, you know, are these replicas meant to, are they seen somewhat as insulting to the place, to the originals? I think there is a question of expectation, of intent, and how audiences experience the spaces. And it made me think, you know, Andrea, in your case, Byrne Jones' picture would have stood out in the entirety of the exhibition there, and it, that it becomes this kind of quiet protest or just complaint, uh, or a few of the words that you mentioned. I'd be curious, 
in what way was he coding his work to be both recognizable to those in the know, but also thinking about a work that was meant to be that alter. So it seems that he is actually appealing to multiple audiences at the same time. One that, to Roland's point, is perhaps subversive, and the other that is about beauty for all. Um, are there specific cues that he's giving us overall? Um, I loved all the primary documents you gave to us about the res the reception, um, but I'd love to hear more about sort of how he's coding that picture. Yeah, and I think this kind of comes back to um, Roland, what you were saying about this ethics of theming, right? So creating a complete replica of the past, I mean, that is, or another site even, like that itself is kind of impossible, right? So it's about making these kind of allusions to the past and then pointing to the present and even the future. And I think that that is how kind of Burton Jones coded that difference is that you can see these kind of allusions, suggestions of this kind of fantastical past, this kind of atemporal space. Um, but there's also these resonances with the contemporary world. And so um, he's trying to create these spaces in his paintings and his craft practice where he is drawing viewers in through aesthetic experience. And then through that drawing in, there comes this, this awakening, this desire to change, this kind of confrontation of what is happening in this fantastical space as opposed to what's happening in you know, everyday reality and trying to kind of like return to reality and change it. And so I think that that is sort of how he's, um, you know, making it a kind of vehicle for change, right? To, to draw the viewer in, to use those kind of sumptuous details, the tactility, the sense of immersion, the opening up of the space through the frame. Um, but then once you're there, you see this vision, okay, we could say it accords with very traditional senses of, you know, what a woman should be, what a man should be, what weakness and power and beauty are. Um, but there is this inversion, right, where poverty is raised above wealth, where what we might perceive as physical weakness is raised above strength, and the kind of, you know, the figure of Cafecho as this imperial knight, which again was, was very much kind of people recognize that right away, um, and how that that is being subverted. So I think it's kind of making that sort of drawing someone in, and then and making the contrast or the um, critique on the present moment. Um, Roland, did you have any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, I think I would just reiterate the points that you made before Roland jumps in, this idea of drawing in and having the aesthetic experience. I mean, I think it's similar to films and theme parks and, and video games, but you know, how do we then ensure that the time has been spent so that the message has been received and that there's not the initial, initial resistance, which we're seeing so much of, that can we allow the world to enter the world or the space without this sort of immediate visceral response. But Roland, throw it to you. No, it's an interesting question because one of the things that I find um, very intriguing about how the Irvine spectrum looks, especially today with there are a few other phases and you know the target has these grills that continue with the horseshoe arches and so forth. Um, so it's not completely gone, although a lot of it is purged and it becomes this sort of what I believe the Irvine Company calls their Palladian architecture, which is sort of this pinkish Palladian architecture that they use um, for most of their buildings. And what's interesting about that is that in that context, it actually heightens the experience of that one hyper theme space as something that is unique and different. And even the experience of how you move around the space becomes very linear in that one space, where it's sort of like you're going through the Alhambra portion. It's like you're, you might be at Disneyland, but you're entering into a small world and you need to like sit there and wait until the ride is over, um, which I think definitely sort of is a very interesting tactic for how you understand the space. I think, you know, I was having a conversation with um, some creators who were interested in like how to make their experience more like a theme park. And I think they were thinking about immersion and seamless experience. And I was like, put a line in front of it that people have to wait to. Like what are sort of the peripheral experiences that we go through to enter certain types of spaces, which for me, I think of very much so um, as someone who also works in the Byzantine liturgy, like what are sort of the rituals that we go through before entering? Are there purification rituals that you enter a space before? These are things that we often sort of separate and sort of like they're the inconvenience of theming, but they are really what I think heightens those spaces and can create these moments of subversion as well. Um, which I think is quite intriguing. Um, for example, there's a Ferris wheel in the middle of the Irvine Spectrum Center that has all the various like 
provinces in Spain. Um, and that's after you've gone through the Alhambra. So there's sort of this like, you're looking back at it quite literally, you're getting an, air, an aerial view of it. And so there are these very interesting tactics that I think are useful for thinking about how experiences are distinguished as unique um, versus part of a broader landscape. When you mentioned the Ferris wheel, I'm also thinking about the Universal Exhibition in Paris with Ferris wheels and the Eiffel Tower. I mean, that, those are those mm -hmm. elements of theming that are inviting you to so many different um, experiences, full bodily experiences. I mean, I've often thought, why don't more museums, art museums, adopt some of these theming principles? I know even in the time I spent at the Getty, we did have conversations with colleagues from Disney, for example, to think about how to improve visitor flow and experience. And we think about this as educators in terms of universally designed coursework and accessibility and gamification of the classroom. I think, you know, in thinking about all of these medievalisms, there's often the question about authenticity and accuracy and whether something that we find fun and interesting, either in cosplay or attending theme parks or um, visiting museums is a serious subject. And I wonder how both of you address those topics with students who, whose inroads to this material might be visiting the Irvine Spectrum or going to Disneyland or watching a film or seeing, I see a, a comment about Bridgerton um, as well in the, in the chat or some film or graphic novel that draws us into a world, to your point, Andrea, about, you know, we've been drawn into a space. Um, how, how do you merge those interests, uh, both for students and then just in general? Well, that's a really great question. And actually, I kind of wanted to, to loop things back to you, Brian, and in your uh, exhibition catalog with Larissa. I mean, I thought that um, you handled the issue so well of the ways in which fantasy can be liberatory, right? It can be used for um, you know, gaining agency, but then also how it can be used to exclude, how it can be co-opted. Um, and there is that, that tension, right? So I wonder actually, if before we get to that, if you wanted to speak to that a little bit and then um, return to that question of, of engaging students with their past experiences. Sure. I mean, I, I can't speak more highly of working with Larissa on the project. Um, I, I think not only is she one of the most brilliant medievalists, but also curators who's willing to experiment with all forms of uh, new media to reach audiences. I think what was so wonderful about the project is that we really had time to to write together. We had an incredible editor, Ruth Lane with the Getty, who also was very actively engaged with us in the process of thinking about how to deal with really at times difficult topics, painful topics, but without, I hope, without shying away from some of the critique. You know, there were certain points in early drafts where we wanted to really critique certain fantasy writers, certain authors for their uh, trans-exclusionary radical feminism. And in writing some of those phrases, we realized, well, in fact, we need to critique the entire study of fantasy. Every one of the writers uh, and creators that we've talked about can be critiqued for, in some way, shape, or form. And that's part of the present moment that we're in to think critically about the, how these stories and visuals are being received, but also to have responsibility uh, to think, what is the future? What does the future look like? Um, that we can have a critical conversation about the, the topics and find a path forward, but also I, I think sit back and take and then make space and recognize the long standing work uh, of, of colleagues who have come before us and who are working now, colleagues of color, women and queer and trans folk, as I mentioned. I mean, that's an aspect I think of broader medievalisms and fantasy in general that still needs to be foregrounded. I loved several of the tweets that I saw yesterday that were reminding us that there's more than just Tolkien in the world of fantasy. I know Michael has asked us about origins of fantasy in the Q&A um, from Morris to C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. There are so many other worlds. And what I would love to see, I guess, in terms of the medievalisms is to recognize other aspects of the world. I'm still waiting for an epic cinematic streaming series of the, of the epic of Sunjata. Um, I know that we got hints in Marvel's um, Black Panther, but I want to see um, 13th and 14th century Mali and the great kingdoms of West Africa come to life. Um, and so I would argue that no, we're seeing elements of fantasy even beyond um, with the oral traditions of the world. So I don't know, there's so much to say. And I think the more we can push back uh, against the sort of dark and ugly and, and really horrible aspects of the fantasy world, um, we can glimpse a future. And I'm just relieved to see that we have that in the solidarity tweets and in the statements by you know, themed organizations. So I know that was a lot more than I wanted to say, but it, I, I felt really passionate to say that 
again, working on the project was really wonderful. Um, and Larissa is a genius. <laughs> I also, one of the things that I wanted to add to this was that, especially from the perspective of Southern California, these questions about theming and medievalism, they're also local histories, which I think is something that's very easy to forget. They're local histories because yes, Disneyland is here, um, but before Disneyland, you know, um, these histories, you know, you have these little castles and turrets everywhere as apartment complexes, these possibilities are largely enabled by the studio system, just as Disney was enabled by the studio system that was experimenting in building these um, various spaces. And so I think that's something that's also very interesting about teaching in Southern California this material. It's not just that students are familiar with the Irvine spectrum and they're like, huh, never thought about that. But there's also the fact that this is very much a unique local history. Um, somebody mentioned the Citadel outlets off of the five. Um, a very interesting moment coming, I believe it was the Firestone factory, um, coming from the moment of the early 20th century and an interest in biblical archaeology. There are fascinating histories in Southern California about recreations based off of like the actions of like um, biblical archaeology in that period. And so there are these really, at this point, there's, there's this way in which medievalism is really a very interesting aspect of 20th century, of the 20th century, and a lot of the sort of interests that have often been traditionally purged from our art historical narratives, but definitely articulate many of the ways in which art history molded itself as a discipline, and also the ways in which that it explored these paths as there was a sort of these industries emerging that were sort of also relying on the data of art historians and archaeologists to recreate these worlds. Yeah, and to come back to kind of students and engaging with these issues, you know, often I find that, you know, students, however they're encountering these things, if they come to the classroom, great, right? <laughs> we can kind of engage with the, you know, their experiences and how they've uh, come to encounter, you know, elements of, you know, Victorianism, medievalism, and popular culture. I think that's all wonderful. And, you know, it, it just serves as a kind of launching point to talk about kind of, okay, what, what is the legacy of this? What is the history? Um, what, how, what can we learn about ourselves and about, about the past um, through that? Actually, where I find more resistance is within academia more broadly, right? I mean, I don't know how many times I had to kind of justify um, looking at the pre-Raphaelites in a serious way that this wasn't in fact, you know, kitsch um, and, and having to kind of justify that as, as a pursuit in the first place when it's just like, oh, okay, that is just, you know, it's tied into popular culture and consumerism and, and it's, you know, fluffy um, and you shouldn't pay any attention to it. So I think that's the kind of the, the more resistance point, whereas, you know, students, I think, you know, you can kind of guide them through, okay, here's where you might have encountered some of these things. Why? Why is it there? And what does it tell us about us and our relationship to the past? I'm relieved to hear you say that, and that was actually the direction I wanted to go in the conversation, because I think you're right. With students, it is often easier to have the conversations, and in academia, that's where we'll hear colleagues say, you know, that's such a fun project. It's so nice that you can do that on the side, um, but what does your serious scholarship look like? And I think this is serious scholarship. That speaks to so many aspects of the hierarchies of uh, genres and fields of study within our discipline, and I, I, I hope another aspect of this recording that lives on for students, anyway, is the promise that there is real serious, important work to be done. Um, I don't think there even needs to be a caveat to that. It is scholarship. Um, and certainly, Roland, I keep thinking about some of your early work. Um, you know, I, I, I still assign to students what you've written about Lady Gaga, because it's such an incredible visual analysis of her work. And in all forms of media presentation, performance, and so forth, and, and perceptions of reality. So I'm relieved to hear that. I think if we can continue to um, encourage our colleagues to no longer share in hushed voices or whispered corners that their guilty pleasure is a sort of medievalizing thing, show, theme park, or otherwise, that we really can continue to move the discussion forward. And that's what thrills me about tomorrow's conversation is that we're going to hear so many topics that take us all around different media, different uh, geographies and more. I know that we're close to 4.15 and we have lots of questions that have come in. Was there more that we wanted to say about some of these topics or can we start to jump into a few of the audience questions? Um, 
Okay, and I will encourage anyone that wants to continue putting questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, we have a few that have come in already, and I know I mentioned it briefly, but I love Michael's question that started us off, that came in early, about this claim about William Morris really inventing um, the fantasy genre with his influence on Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, specifically the invention of imaginary worlds, the sub uh, genre of modern fan fantasy, uh, pseudo medieval in their atmosphere, tinged with magic. Um, I'll actually toss this to Andrea, if that's all right. Um, how do you feel about this uh, sort of uh, assignment of Morris as sort of the inventor of the modern fantasy uh, genre? Well, it's a really great question. And I think, Brian, I should point out there, there are multiple ways that you could trace those lineages of fantasy. I think Morris is a really key figure. Um, you know, he definitely it had some kind of direct connections to Tolkien and to C.S. Lewis, um, and particularly his kind of late romances. I'm more familiar with, you know, uh, Dream of John Ball and News from Nowhere and the kind of more uh, overtly socialist dream vision novels, but the late romances as well are kind of being rediscovered as these um, points of, of influence for later um, fantasy writers. Um, and, you know, I think there are elements there that are really important, right, not just kind of culling these lessons from the past, but also the emphasis on the environment, um, right, there's so much of what Morris is writing, not just in News from Nowhere, but about the importance of paying attention to the environment, and that is so important now, we were just talking about the heat waves, you know, climate change is such a pressing issue for us and the way that you know he's looking to those um, environmental elements and including that in fantasy and you also get a sense of that in, in Tolkien. Um, and I actually want to um, refer people to John Plotz's work at Brandeis because he's um, written, I just read a really great essay um, by him uh, making those kind of connections, looking at particularly the non-human world um, in Morris and its, its influence on later um, fantasy writers. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I know that was an aspect of writing the book with Larissa that we kept going back to because our editor kept asking, well, you're going to have to come down somewhere about when fantasy originates. And I know at one point we had a conversation about if we shift our glance away from Europe or the Mediterranean or even North America, um, there are so many other global traditions where imaginary worlds are created. Um, even within something like the Persian epic, the Shah Nahme, there are real worlds and then there are really fantastic events that happen similar to European chronicles. But I've been really fascinated as we were reminded by um, some of our peer reviewers and readers for the book and the exhibition um, that Black and African-American literature and African literature today um, in the realm of fantasy is thriving from, you know, N.K. Jemisin's work uh, really uh, draws from all of the aesthetics of medieval European court and culture, but in an African context. It highlights the African kingdoms that coexisted. Uh, and then uh, Marlon James, I know there's been uh, mixed reviews of some of the work, The Black Leopard, Red Wolf. This is one uh, that I've read through a number of times and think critically about in terms of gender um, and sexual violence and violence in general themes that often enter into fantasy because there's a sense of a need for kind of an authenticity to some past moment. But I think to the point, Andrew, that you raised earlier, there's also a hope for the future that can come as well, that we can confront the issues, um, perhaps better than something like Game of Thrones. It just throws it out there as kind of gratuitous. So um, I like thinking of you know other many different starting points for the realm of fantasy. Um, Roland, is there anything you wanted to say about fantasy in general and how it relates to theming and, and your work? I know, especially with Byzantium, that's an important topic as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I think especially from my vantage point from Byzantium, you know, there's obvious you know, I, one of something I've recently published is really about the fact that the Venetian, you know, themed over San Marco, but the one missing building in the Venetian is San Marco, um, which I think is something really fascinating that the Byzantine is purged purposely, might be too religious, there may be many reasons. Um, but one of the things that I think is interesting also is that Byzantium has these relationships where the West was often engaging in what today we would call theming or various forms of simulacral spaces. I think about the looting of relics from Constantinople and the creation of Saint-Chapelle. Um, I think also about St. Saint Mark's as well, um, emulating the imperial mausoleum of holy apostles in Constantinople. Um, you have already in the Middle Ages these desires, whether it is a church seeking to be an image of the heavenly Jerusalem, or whether it is these sort of more imperial competitions um, oftentimes associated with the looting of objects um, that also incorporate these elements of 
theming in ways that we oftentimes have not incorporated it. Even museums, why are you building in a neoclassical style? How do your wings differ? Um, those represent also very much histories of how these types of spaces and sort of treasuries of loot have been built um, since the Middle Ages. And of course, there are ancient um, Greek and Roman antecedents to that as well, and other examples from across the global Middle Ages. And so for me, that's also one of the things I like doing is to present to my students that this is an ongoing history, and that the most medieval aspects about these spaces are not the iconography or the citational like list. I think there's a sort of BuzzFeed listicle, like how many citations does it actually count to be actually medieval? Um, but really this idea that there are practices here, this desire is the most medievalizing aspect of these spaces. This desire is for emulation and sort of processional ritual. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. And there are, of course, two questions here that touch on the, the points that you've raised about simulacra. Do, does this production of simulacra dull the mind or foster intellectual curiosity is the first? And then a question that touches on potential othering in a site like um, Batu Galaxy's Edge. Um, what are your thoughts on both this, the uh, either the benefits or the dulling of simulacra and then also these othering elements that come across? Well, I mean, I think that as a medievalist, one of the things that I, I find most interesting is that these sort of simulacral spaces really um, are sort of spaces that are meant to be sort of perplexed through. You you sort of struggle with iconography. You, you know, there is a sort of very much a Western idea of the grand tour where you're at home with your books, with your friends and showing off how many citations you can rattle off. And that's, there's very much a sort of competitive and highly sort of intellectual sort of banal way form of it, but that is often how we've understood the academy. So I think that it's important to embrace that. Um, and I think of it a little bit as a sort of reliquary box. You're sort of opening it up, pulling it apart, contemplating the inscriptions, moving it around. There are these practices that are very much contempl contemplative and maybe those that these spaces sometimes aren't the best for, but that they definitely have the space to do that with. I took 18 students to Las Vegas for a class on simulacral spaces. And I can say that there is a lot to work through on site in particular, because it's so hard to understand these spaces. But I do think that, you know, theming has this very sort of deep and problematic side of it, which is the othering. I mean, how do you create a dangerous and scary place? Um, and what are the citations that you use for that? How do you produce spaces that don't appear to be themed? Um, what are the elements? And I think that there are really sort of interesting sort of histories in the sense that people are often very open about how they go about doing those scary and dangerous places in ways that you would be shocked that they would be saying openly. And so I think that that's something that's also, you know, to be aware of, like, what do these spaces, what narratives do they reify? Um, what assumptions do they expect you to have about the world that not all audiences will have about the world? And I think that's also what is really powerful about theming, because as a sort of cultural critic, you can also look at these expectations and historicize them in our present or in our near past, um, and begin to understand and parse out how these um, sort of themings are constructed, when do they fall out of fashion and why? Um, so I think that is one of the most powerful thing that theming has is sort of a document of our period. It's not just to sort of produce institutional critique in the present, but to also understand the histories um, of these various forms of racism, colonialism, imperialism, and so forth that are very much present in many of these spaces as well. Yeah, and I think that touches squarely on what um, Andrew was sharing with us earlier as well about the the inherent critique behind some of the spaces. I mean, a question that, that came up just from Larissa right now to me, um, build upon what was just asked um, about the simulacral spaces and othering. And I wondered to, to ask um, Andrea, um, what is the role then that fantasy thinking uh, in experiencing these themed spaces, much like the historical art in you know, Burne Jones creation or the pre-Raphaelites, um, how much does that experience rely on the inherent suspension of belief or the suspension of disbelief uh, rather uh, in the world? That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kept thinking back, you know, uh, rolling through your comments about, um, you know, the simulacra, simulacral spaces, um, really going back to those expositions, right? And, and particularly the ways in which um, there is a kind of straight line between the colonial exhibits and places like Epcot, 
Um, you know, and the way in which that is this kind of appropriation as an assertion of, of dominance and co-optation um, in, in a, a theoretical and quite literal um, sense. And so I think there is a kind of danger there that we have to be aware of, of the way in which that kind of legacy can be continued on untroubled. Um, you know, I mean, I think it really comes down to the conversations that come out of the experiences of these places, right? Um, you know, how you can look to them and sort of think, okay, why is this being quoted? How is it being quoted? Um, and how can we kind of learn from and build on um, that, you know, tradition and maybe, you know, move away from certain ways of co-opting um, the architecture and traditions of other cultures in a way that, um, you know, perpetuates colonialism um, still today. And that's you know, a huge issue within the museum as well. Yeah, and I think one of the most pressing things is how these trajectories have persisted, even though there's there's not a sort of always a sort of historical adjacency to them, a sort of a passing of the baton directly, how they sort of reemerge and they're very similar. It's sort of reinventing the colonialist like World's Fair again and again. And so that's really also fascinating about something inherent in sort of this Western project and how it sees the world and relates to others. Um, of course, there's also like the 1964 World's Fair, which is a great sort of way of thinking about this in which Disney itself postulate, posits itself against and around um, too. So there are these really interesting ways to also, I think these questions also really create a really interesting narrative that is quite unbroken through the Middle Ages and into the past. That is a great way of teaching all these various spaces that have often been left out of art history. Um, and which is one of the reasons why I feel like documentation is also so important um, and having to you know, parse it all out oftentimes takes more work than when you know, your colleagues are familiar with the material you're working on. But yeah, no, that's a great comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Larissa, for the question, both of you for answering. I know that I see uh, two other really, really important questions, one of which I know I want to end with because it's something uh, that I think will leave us with more to think about. Um, I wanted to uh, pose the question that we have from Mauricio in the chat. Um, could you talk a little bit about the theoretical methodological possibilities of the research concerning the relationship of medievalism and visual culture and a follow-up that um, a lot of researchers are uh, are being developed, or at least research is being developed in that sense, but it seems to, to him at least, there's not much theoretical or methodological debate, debate about the topic. I mean, I keep thinking that with medievalisms and visual culture and fantasy studies, what I'm drawn to at the moment really is fandom studies, adaptation studies, um, studies that really get into those aspects and theming studies. I mean, that Roland, you're working on as well. I think those aspects uh, of an approach to the visual aspects of medievalism are important. And also that so many of the studies that I mentioned earlier in terms of medieval studies themselves are happening in the field of literature or comparative literature. And so art history as a discipline for some of these topics is catching up. I, I hope that's fair to say. Not all of us, some some on this call even are at the forefront. Um, but how, how do you feel about this idea of the, the methodologies towards medievalism, visual culture, anything else? Should I begin? Um, yeah, no, I mean, so it's interesting because, you know, you have, for example, Baudrillard's Simulation Simulacra, which uh, very much sort of overtaught, and I always struggle with that text and how to teach it with students. It's also really problematic text, which you realize when you read it more recently, has a lot of sort of contemplations on Byzantium as well, which I did not remember from early days of grad school and undergrad. Um, and so there's like Umberto Eco and these sort of classic readings that we always turn to. And then there is a very sort of splintered space. There's a lot of interesting conversations happening in sort of the themed entertainment industry that have their own sort of theories and methodologies. There are more sort of quantitative studies on tourism, which I'm less interested in, um, but that still can be helpful um, for understanding where this work is being done. And then, you know, for me, one of the one of the types of work that's most helpful in thinking about theming is, for example, like Chris Wood's Forgery Replica Fiction and Chris Wood and Alex Nagel's Anachronic Renaissance. This, I mean, maybe Chris and Alex Nagel would be horrified to hear this, but they they really contribute a lot to questions about theming. I mean, these ideas of like the fungibility of objects, um, these sort of chains of replication, the sort of like insecurity about time and its flow, these big questions in art history about temporality are inherent in what these 
um, simulacral spaces do. And when I define simulacral spaces, I often say that there are things that sort of unsettle our associations to time and space, because I feel like that's the broadest thing that I can use to define it. And that might be a museum experience. Um, it might also be your walk through a casino in Las Vegas. And so I think that there is a really interesting, there's a very fragmented body of work being done. And there's also a lot of sort of methodological approaches within the history of art in very conventional senses that are really useful for this. You can turn to Krautheimer's understanding of medieval architecture and replication. These are all sort of studies that we have often read in art history method seminars, but that we've isolated from these conversations because that's the serious stuff and this is the not serious stuff. So you can talk about Jerusalem and Crusader architecture, but do not talk about Disneyland. Um, and so I think those are really um, interesting sort of conversations that are being had as well at the moment. And there's a lot of movement happening in these spaces right now. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, that there are all these kind of texts, traditional methodological approaches that you can draw on to kind of um, theorize and work through some of this. Um, but there is this kind of uh, fragmented scholarship that's happening here and there and in different er areas of the field. Um, and I think, you know, opening up to, you know, an engagement with things like social media, I mean, uh, Brian and Larissa, in your, in your catalog, you mentioned this idea of kind of social medieval or social medievalism, right, which is in some ways the origins of this, of this exhibition project, right, um, and kind of opening up to that and, and allowing that and, and theorizing that, but there's a lot of work, I think, still, still to come, um, and, and just to kind of put one of my questions out there, I was just wondering about, you know, the generation of this um, exhibition project and the decision to kind of allow, you um, uh, museum staff's personal objects to come into the space and like what that was like, if you can give us a little bit of the behind the scenes on that. Well, I don't want to tell too many stories out of school, mainly because, I, you know, Larissa and I had so many conversations about the show um, before I transitioned to the classroom in 2020. And, you know, initially we had conceived a space that we were calling the medieval fantasy bookshelf uh, that would feature uh, books from our collection and others uh, that really highlighted the book as object and also the art of many of the, the book covers and to show the real range of uh, medievalisms in fantasy literature, um, including manga and um, graphic novels and comic books and so forth. So that's where it started. And then Larissa really had this ingenious idea to bring in more of the staff. And I think that from my perspective, having left the institution at that point and been a cheerleader on the side watching it come together, to me, it was exciting to see and learn aspects of colleagues that I had worked very closely with that I knew nothing about their medievalizing interests or backgrounds um, and the way that they could engage their own families, a partner, a child, a relative who also had those interests. I mean, my sense is that this really touched on more than just the staff. I mean, it had the impact of forming a kind of community. Um, everyone that I've heard go through the show and that I've taken through the exhibition finds that space really one of the most engaging aspects of the space, and I would agree. I also hope in future presentations about this topic that museums find ways to incorporate those objects in the spaces with the art, I'll say in, in air quotes, that, you know, I think of them as the works of art. There's great artistry and craft behind them. Um, so there's a lot more I, I hope that Larissa can share tomorrow about that. Uh, but really, if nothing else, it was just delightful to hear from so many colleagues um, how thrilled they were to share their objects. And I think, to, I hope to see themselves validated in their love, in their interests, and to, I'll say this on record, break down the boundaries between this idea of curator or keeper of collections and keeper of knowledge. I mean, I really firmly believe, as I know Larissa does, this idea that we are learning just as much with our communities, um, probably more than we're imparting or presenting um, in the gallery space. Um, that's where social media has become such a, a fertile realm for analysis and participation, not just for study. Um, I think there's a lot of potential qualitative studies that can be done in future, looking at the responses that audiences have online to certain social medievalisms. Um, I'm already looking at the comments about um, uh, the, the Rings of Power on Amazon Prime and can't wait to sort of make sense of this in a global sense. But anyway, those are my two cents there. I will say, I, I do love the question that we have from Emily Song. Um, first of all, I love that you're a high school student tuning in. I love that you have this interest in art history. And there's a specific, a very important question for Andrea about the Pre-Raphaelites, uh, their attitude specifically towards women in 
art, especially categorizing them into you know femme fragile or um, femme fatale. Does Burne Jones uh, do his works fall into these tropes um, as seeing the femme fragile um, or fatale as a damsel in distress, or does he subvert these expectations? And where does the Lady of Shalott fit into seeing strong women um, being seen as weak by falling in love? Um, as a Lady of Shalott fan, I'm thrilled that there's a mention there. So Andrea, over to you. Thanks so much for that question. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly you could, and, and, and Burn Jones has been critiqued for perpetuating some of these kind of stereotypes of either the seductress or the kind of, you know, weak woman in need of rescuing. But I think the more that you really look at the way he's portraying gender, he plays with it a little bit more than you would expect. There's a lot of androgyny in his work. Um, there's a lot of kind of uh, flipping of expectations of gender on different characters. Um, and one of the things about King Cofetua is that when it was um, debuted, uh, at the Grosvenor Gallery, there was this like, oh, finally, Burne Jones is painting women the way they should be painted and men the way they should be painted. And all this kind of commentary about the virility of King Cofetua. Um, and so he was really praised for what they saw as a kind of a departure in his career of kind of, you know, not having androgynous or, you know, fig figures that were um, testing the gender boundaries. Um, but as far as the kind of paraphilites more broadly, yes, some of them do play into that. But I think there was, again, opening up of these spaces, there were lots of women artists that were involved in the pre-Raphaelite circle, and there's being more and more amazing scholarship um, conducted around those artists that have been marginalized of the ways in which they could use that kind of resistance and protest against modernity in order to kind of assert alternative identities um, around uh, kind of queerness and alternative sexualities. Um, so, I can't say that, you know, overall, like the Paraphilites and their circle are so diverse that there's a lot of different elements in that. Some of them do kind of reinforce or perpetuate those stereotypes, but there are lots of places of resistance um, that I think shows, again, the kind of potential that we were talking about, about, about the genre. So thanks for that question. Thank you. Yeah, that was really a wonderful, a very lovely question, a very um, poignant as well. I know there are some other really great comments that I just noticed in the chat before I get to um, Hector Isla's question um, that I wanted us to sort of think more deeply about. Um, there was this note about the Society uh, for Creative Anachronism, the SCA, which is something that Larissa and I certainly thought about for the show. And I think that's where, you know, again, medievalists always, okay, and I'm not going to say medievalists, all, all medievalists, but there is still at times that tendency, um, as we talked about earlier in terms of scholarly circles, to create a kind of categorization or hierarchy of different um, um, uh, approaches to the past. And yet whenever a medievalist, a uh, scholar of the Middle Ages proper, wants to know how an astrolabe works or how to make a trebuchet, um, they're going to turn to the Society for Creative Anachronism, which is an incredibly serious and important uh, um, uh, you know, group of people, creatives, that uh, really experiment with hands-on um, you know, craft. There are also problems with anything like the historical European martial arts and society for creative anachronism, the same way there are problems in museums with racism and so forth. So I think it's something to be aware of for those students uh, in this space. But then I also love the point that we had from Nancy Marsh about um, the paperback cover artists don't always have the chance to read the book. Um, and so they're working on whatever editor inscription is given. Um, this is true of both the Ace and the Valentine Lord of the Rings editions, which I think absolutely remember looking at those covers and trying to find the connections. So um, there's something wonderful there in thinking about, you know, how we might internalize a cover for a book as being the world making uh, for a realm that the ar the artist may not have actually had access to the text itself. Um, and then I see that uh, Jerry Knowles has a question that's coming about Dungeons and Dragons. What are our thoughts on the recent efforts to further represent diversity? Um, you know, I have really appreciated that they were very honest and transparent in their statement that in 2020, they acknowledged that um, we've listened we, uh, we hear that there is a desire for a comment and we reaffirm the mission of Dungeons and Dragons to embrace fantasy as an imaginative creative genre that welcomes all forms of um, beast and of good um, representative of all groups and people. I mean, it was an approach. It may not have been perfect. I'm sure it didn't please everyone, but in looking at communities like D&D um, &D and looking at Ren Fairs and medieval times and other gatherings, I think what Larissa and I found more and more is this draw um, to welcome 
people, as a, as a queer non-binary person, I feel really welcome in those spaces, not just because I'm surrounded by nerds, um, but because being a queer person in that space doesn't feel different, doesn't feel as a form of alterity. There's already this kind of acceptance that I wouldn't otherwise necessarily always feel um, if I'm dressed in liturgical garments you know, elsewhere, right? Um, so there's that aspect that I really love. Um, and then the other thing that I know is often stated is that whatever period we're studying, 19th century looking at Burne Jones, is revealing more uh, about Burne Jones and his concerns than about the medieval past or the stories that he's looking at. In the same way, medievalisms today on screen or at the Irvine spectrum are telling us more about our expectations of the past or imaginations of the past um, than they are about the past itself. Of course, there's a bridge between there. But to the question more specifically, then, in our opinion, why are people so drawn to the Middle Ages? Is it simply looking or searching for an escape from today's hectic lifestyles? I think there can be many ways to answer this, but I'd love to know your thoughts of why are we so drawn to the Middle Ages in all its forms? Well, and I think you should jump in with this one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I sort of want to answer this as a Byzantinist more specifically, um, because I think that that's what I love about, you know, I've, I've never came to the middle to working on the Middle Ages because I like knights or dragons. Like I, I don't actually care much about that at all. Um, even though I've always loved Lord of the Rings. Um, I've, uh, but I, one of the things that I really, I love about working on the sort of medievalisms around Byzantium is first of all, trying to figure out like what hectic idea was produced of Byzantium that is allowing it to be cited. Um, probably the most passing reference um, that I remember to Byzantium is in the show New Girl, where Zoe de Chanel's character is staying at a hotel, wants to have a fancy night, and she calls up the front desk and asks for some form of erotic movie, perhaps in, set in the Byzantine era. Um, and it's sort of that chaos that Byzantium tends to produce in its citations that I think is most fascinating because it often appears through obfuscation or removal. Um, it often speaks to very idiosyncratic knowledge of Byzantium um, by an author or creator that then sort of spirals into a very interesting sort of, but also very um, fragmented thread. And so one of the things that for me really is exciting there is to have this sense of like, not just what attracted you to the Middle Ages, but what did the Middle Ages become, this particular sliver of the Middle Ages. And it's been very interesting to hear when sort of pressing scholar, um, sort of creators who are citing Byzantine art, it's like, why did you cite Byzantium and not this or that? I had a very interesting conversation with one of the set designers um, for Justice League um, about Wonder Woman sort of um, apocalyptic cave scene, which is all Byzantine frescoes and Greek inscriptions. And it was really interesting because in some ways it was it was not the ancient origin of Wonder Woman, but it was somewhere in between modernity. And so that also lent the sort of like, you know, this medieval Greek world. And so seeing these various forms of nationalism, of various forms of spirituality, you know, the fact that we have um, synagogues built in a Byzantine style to not be Gothic <laughs> or to become too Protestant and avoiding the Gothic that is associated with Catholicism. These are really fascinating things that for me has shown not, not simply an attraction, but what, what becomes sort of this like beeline that the Byzantine offers for, for creators in various ways. And that's really what draws me to that complexity. It's never the same. And oftentimes through the 20th century, it's been queer creators um, that have been most drawn and creators of color who have been most drawn to Byzantium because it's medieval, but it's not. And that relationality is really powerful. So that's my answer. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, something that the exhibition and the catalog establishes really well, right, is that the medieval has become this kind of a repository for, you know, the fantastical, for folk tales and fairy tales, for kind of locating that kind of collective imagination in this time that is clearly not now, right? Um, and so I think that that is where the draw and the power comes, creating these kind of juxtapositions and differences. Now within that, right, I think there's a lot of complexity that's hard to kind of sum up in one big way. Um, but I think, you know, that is a way in which we can conceptualize it perhaps that it is this kind of site where you can play, again, coming back to that idea of these kind of utopias, these pockets of stasis from which you can kind of reflect back, step away and reflect back on the current moment. 
Yeah, I, thank you, Andrew, for bringing it back to points that you made also about Burne Jones and thinking about this, you know, drawing in and then having that aesthetic experience as a way to, you know, critique, contemplate, and so forth. I love, I, I agree and echo Larissa's comment in the chat about why are we often also drawn to the pre-Raphaelites? And I also was one of those individuals with those posters in my dorm room, the Belle Dame Saint Merci, um, and the Lady of Shalom. I mean, in, in works that we're going to hear discussed tomorrow, I, I'm, I'm certain of it. And then the question um, about the difference between Gothic revival and medievalism, I mean, really, Gothic revival is a form of medievalism, and there are many different Gothic revivals. I think, you know, there is stylistic Gothic revival and so forth. It's a larger topic for our concluding remarks. But I did also want to say, I think in relation to Sarah's great exhibition that I'm excited to see in a few weeks um, at the Haggerty, with Tolkien, I mean, there is an entire realm and love for all things Tolkien. And I think to return to the question of fandoms and expectations again, I know there is often this intense love for material that we feel so familiar with, whether it's the historical Middle Ages or the fantasy stories that we know, either from childhood or adulthood or otherwise, texts that we may have lived with quite literally in learning languages and, 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 and dressing um, you know, in cosplay and so forth. And so there can be this resistance to medievalism as well. Um, not always because of who's making it and whatnot, but I think it's it's careful to keep in mind what is the actual critique? Um, is it about the casting? And what does that say about the concerns of people today? Not about Tolkien, not about the Middle Ages. Um, and that fantasy should be expansive. These are magical worlds where anything should and can be possible. And I think that's a promise uh, for fantasy futures, as our symposium's title suggests. So with that, I really want to thank Roland and Andrea for your time for sharing to everyone in the audience who's attended, who's submitted questions, who's also had a really active chat. I've loved seeing the back and forth between a cover illustrator artists, which has really wowed me. Um, so thank you for your engagement and I'll turn it over to Larissa for some concluding remarks and housekeeping. Wow, yes. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, and thank you to Brian for um, a very able uh, moderating of the discussion. Um, and also thank you so much to Roland and Andrea for your insights uh, in terms of medievalism. And I, I'm actually going to have to go to the Irvine Spectrum Center now and really take a close look at it. Um, and what a wonderful conversation from members of the audience. And um, I hope that this is just a preview of the um, topics and themes that we'll get to tomorrow. Um, so please uh, make sure to join us um, tomorrow beginning at 9 a.m. Pacific uh, for a full day of talks about a huge variety of topics in medievalism uh, and pop culture, everything from Magic the Gathering to Crusader Kings 3 and everything in between. We'll get to more pre -Raphaelite and it will be a great time. So please make sure to join us online um, tomorrow. And thank you to the panelists and Brian again um, so much for this wonderful conversation. And thanks to all of you for tuning in.